What's up, everybody? It's the Waiting for Next Year.com podcast. It is the return of Scott Rabb. And I'm not going to waste too much of your time with uh, intro here. I'm looking forward to talking to Scott Rabb. It's been a while. We used to talk to him every week, and I, I miss I miss talking to him. He's very fun to talk to. So um, this is brought to you by Audible. You can start your free trial with Audible with a uh, free audiobook, 30-day free trial. Some of you have signed up already. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, and it really is a good service. It's one that I actually use. There are over 180,000 titles, uh, and I'm sure that number grows like every day. There are audiobooks. Um, you can read when you're commuting, when you're running on the treadmill, whatever you, uh, whatever chores you're doing, it only gets better with an audiobook. So that's audibletrial.com forward slash WFNY, audibletrial.com forward slash WFNY. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, here's Scott Rabb. As promised, on the line, uh, nobody I'd rather talk to about the the legacy of Mark Shapiro as he heads to Toronto and other topics. Scott Rabb, how's it going, sir? It's going okay. As promised, what is that? Who do you promise? Um, I started doing a little intro before I a little intro so that I could do all the stupid promo stuff ahead of time right. and not bother all my right. guests with that. Uh, I. I I worry, you know, there's already enough pressure. Just, <laughs> just thinking about uh, talking about Mark Shapiro and, you know, the Browns, oh, my God, it's it's 9.02 a.m. Yes. as we speak. Whoa, the decisions, the decisions they have, oh, my God, who they, ooh, Terrell, ooh, ooh, well, Terrell Pryor, but, ooh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> big day, big cut down day. So you're make saying a huge, that huge, huge difference in the in the season. Oh, huge! Are they going to keep Vince Mayo? I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm being sarcastic there. We we can get to that. No, it, it's it, it's probably as good a place as any to start because the 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 way we talk about the way we add gravity to certain parts of Brown's season and off season as if it's going to mean anything by the time we get to the end of October. It's kind of goofy. It's what's, it's what's left. You know, I, I've, I've kind of I followed uh, uh, the Cavs season very, very intently and spent a lot of time in Cleveland. Had a little, little bedroom in Brook Park, uh, and it was great while, while it lasted and, and got me back, back in touch in, in a more uh, consistent way. Uh, with with uh, the city and and with with friends and and with sports with Cleveland sports and and this is what we have and and you see evidence of it with all the moderating that you do or that that uh, you know people enforce a kind of group think on on my favorite uh, they'll hate they'll hate seeing that I don't participate anymore in, in the websites but on Let's Go Tribe which is I I, I think the highest quality. Uh, or the one I go to most often uh, in terms of the tribe or with the Browns. I mean, you really, you really aren't left with much as a Cleveland sports fan except to worry about whether <laughs> whether Vince Mayo is going to make the roster or not. And, and and it's sad. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be backbiting and and feuding on any message board uh, uh, with a with a winner uh, because you know I, I see it on the Cavs message board. Uh, not to the same degree, but you know it's sad because we we don't know we don't have a control group of Cleveland lifelong Cleveland fans who are engaging in discourse based on uh, you know a exciting promising Brown season. So you you, you kind of I, I had a Twitter exchange with a guy I really like uh, Jordan Zerm, uh, and and uh, I, I forget the precise nature of the debate. It was probably, and it wasn't really a debate. And, and at one point he said, "You know, I'm I'm young and naive." And and I said, "I understand. You know, give it a few, give it a few decades." Well, and the, all the all the stuff that we've been talking about lately just occurs to me that it's a distraction from the fact that uh, the the Browns general manager is going to be suspended here in the next uh, 30 seconds or so and and we can we 
can't seem to bring ourselves to talk about the fact that he probably wasted the eighth overall pick, not to mention the 22nd overall pick in his first draft as GM, and now he's suspended for his second year. And, and just to revisit a, a couple of general managers ago, I think this is emblematic in many ways of Cleveland sports. No one, no one wants to hear the name Trent Richardson without cackling over what a coup that was. Yeah, <clears throat> we we. I, I, by the way, I, I'll preface this again with with people uh, uh, back when it was a fresh debate. I would still like to hear, see any evidence whatsoever that after Trent Richardson's rookie season. And you can go back to footballreference.com and look at it. It wasn't, it wasn't a perfect rookie season by any means, but I, I, he caught more passes than Josh Gordon. He, he scored 11 touchdowns. And I don't remember anyone, anyone, professional, amateur, <clears throat> anyone, suggesting that this guy really needs to be put on the market to see what we can get for him. It is very typical of Cleveland fans to pay far more attention to what a great trade that was because, in retrospect, Trent Richardson has had a failed career than it is for them to go back and see, hey, at the time, nobody, almost, almost without, he had played two games in his second season. I, I don't know anyone who wasn't, A, shocked by the trade, and B, wondering what the hell was going on. That Yeah, they got a number one, but... but the message they were sending was, we're tanking this season. Not, not an unfamiliar message, by the way, once you take away all the shiny keys about Duke Johnson and Therese. It's not an unfamiliar message to any Browns fan. But in the ensuing seasons, oh, my God, the delight that, that you know, paid media and, and all the fans, oh, and watching Trent Richardson fail, what a glorious victory for the Cleveland Browns. No, no. We got a number one from the Colts and turned it into, I believe, uh, the number 22, right? Yes. 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 So, we, so we traded Trent Richardson for, for Johnny Manziel. I would suggest to you, even now and going forward, we'd have been better off keeping Trent Richardson. Ooh, what a horrible, he's an idiot. He's a senile old man, really. Well, I would have suggested that you look around at the skill players on other rosters, not just in the AFC North, but in the NFL, and find a weaker group of skill players on offense than Ray Farmer has assembled for his football team. You can't. You can't. But the, yeah, the, I, the idea is that, uh, that Trent Richardson trade was also used as a grand justification to try and, and convince ourselves, and, and not ourselves, ourselves, but Browns fans convince themselves that – that somehow Joe Banner, the guy that they were left with, stuck with at the time, was somebody that they could deal with. And simply everybody knew or should have known that that dude was toxic because he'd always been toxic. But, you know, using the Trent Richardson trade as a way to kind of justify that the future wasn't doomed with with uh, with Joe Banner because and and that's that's like a a theme for Browns fans. It's always trying to figure out a way to justify the future that they think they're stuck with. And and, and the accompanying Schadenfreude of of looking at a guy like Trent Richardson, who who may or may not ever play another down in the NFL. It's very easy to judge any trade, including Mark Shapiro's, in in retrospect. I mean, in any sport, any business decision by the way, and that's really something I'd like to focus on. Uh, uh, you know, you, you can't simply say that in retrospect this was a brilliant move, and as far as Johnny Football or, or you know, for that matter, Corey Kluber, you can't, you can't say that X number of years down the road I was right. I'm not, I'm not here to be right. It's kind of like any other relationship. It's like it's not it's not a win lose thing when you when you're dealing with other human beings. It's like how how do you clear away some of the emotion? How do you clear away you know some of the anger in 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 the case of of again any relationship, whether it's us and these teams, each other as fans, or your life partner, and somehow gain some understanding of the business that that's being conducted in front of you, and and it's not necessarily Joe Banner's fault that he only had this limited window of time. 
I mean, I, I knew enough from the people that I know in Philly to know, you know, the, what a smart guy he was and what a dick he was. And, and you know, I watched the city council meeting where, where Joe Banner would come and sell, you know, basically shake the city down for a few more million, to, you know, to keep Cleveland strong as always. Let's let's give the billionaires a few more, you know, a few more million dollars of taxpayers' money to put up uh, the new scoreboards. But really, all we're talking about, whether we're talking about the tribe, the Cavs, the Browns, sports talk radio in Cleveland, we're talking about capitalist enterprise. And by the way, I don't like predatory capitalism, but you know, I'm cool on capitalism, and and that's really what we're talking about. And when they start dangling the shiny keys. You know, to distract the grumpy kids, so that everyone, you know, on, on the on the money making side of the microphone has something really, really important to talk about, like Vince Mayo versus Terrell Pryor or or whatever. You know, really, it, it keeps us very busy, tearing at each other's throats and hating on each other. It's very difficult to step back and go, you know, there's really no there there. This team sucks, and I'm talking about the Browns in particular. Well, and there seems to be a lot of this we want to turn our sports talk into debate team where there c- can be a winner and a loser. And I, I like to think that it's, it's a lot, it's a lot simpler than that. It's not about trying to retrofit the facts after the fact, whether we're talking about Trent Richardson or Ubaldo Jimenez, um, though it's not about trying to go back and win the debate. It's about, all right, I, I, I follow a team that continuously sends the message that they're going to sell. And they're going to try and be smarter than everybody, not by trying to win now, but but sell. And when we're talking about the Indians who seemingly, you know, trade with trades uh, peace to St. Louis every single year so that St. Louis can make a run for it um, or the Browns trading Trent Richardson, you know, those send messages to those locker rooms and to those players and to the fans. And and it's it's a. It's that's it's a philosophy, and and I don't think it's a, a fun one. Everyone, everyone, I think you're right. I think everyone. I mean, it's fun to win the debates, and the debates are fun. The problem is for Cleveland sports fans, particularly fans of the Browns right now, and uh, you know the Indians in in many ways, despite the fact that there's a second wild card that they're mathematically uh, in the running for. But but we don't get to win happy debates. That, that I guess that's my point. Is you could say well. Joe Banner was right, and Trent Richardson sucks, and that's fine. You know, you won the debate. The problem is the team turned Trent Richardson into Johnny Football, and so winning the debate is really not what, I mean, we all want the same thing. I presume as fans, we want, you know, Cleveland teams, if they can't win a championship, to compete in in something other than a mathematical way. You know, theoretically, everyone's even, or theoretically, the, the Indians are going to get, get into a one-game playoff again. You know, the truth of the matter is, you know, we're, we're, we don't have a lot really going on on the field to merit the kind of emotion that we bring to the debates, because, you know, it's, it's a tough landscape. I don't need to tell you or anyone else. It's a, it's a very, very, and, and like I said earlier in reference to the, the Twitter thing, I've watched it for a long time, long time. Oh, you, you mean the the rising tide on Twitter? Not the rising tide on uh, tide on Twitter, which is just a symptom. The disease is I've watched I've watched these teams and these front offices for a long time, and and, and I think I think it's fair and, and not not arrogant. I think it's it's just truthful. Uh, I've also paid probably vastly more attention to other teams in all these sports in other cities where the front offices you know aren't 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 as bad as, bad, as feckless and in some ways as hamstrung uh, and you're thinking about baseball in particular as as the Cleveland front offices i i, I really you know i i, I really I, it's funny to you make these statements sometimes out of emotion and and sometimes at least it feels like like in this case, not out of emotion, I, I I would find it very difficult to stop paying very close attention to the Cleveland teams because it's basically that 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 big a part of my life, which is its own its, its own symptom uh, individually. For you know, the the problem is I'm not sure that I care very much unless the team gives me a reason to care. 
Well, and in my younger days, I would have called that kind of front running and or it is front running. Yes. I, yeah, it is. But and I would have judged it harshly. But I, I very much find myself the same way, especially with the Indians, because they can't even figure out like uh, I understand realities and economic realities and whatever else. But it's one thing to live in that system and try and compete in that system and another to just sound so conciliatory all the time. And under Mark Shapiro over the last 10 plus years, it's always sounded so damn conciliatory. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by conciliatory. I'm not trying to be clever here. I'm just not sure what you mean by conciliatory. It, it was always, it was never, um, well, we, we think we can do this thing a smart way and, and win and compete consistently. It was, well, we'll do the best we can. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm processing it through that because I was looking at the, uh, you know, the Shapiro regime just, just in terms of the, you know, baseballreference.com franchise history page where you can look at the records, uh-huh. uh, the one loss records. And, you know, I, I've done this before, but it, this was a long time ago, and I'm sure it was for a podcast we did where you can track attendance along with the one loss records. And I'm not saying you can necessarily filter out things like, well, Jacobs Field was new. And the Browns were stolen, and they, you know, it, it, you you can you can certainly, if you're more technologically adept than I am, come up with with a wonderful, you know, wonderful spreadsheet that tries to correlate, even if there's no causation there, uh, the economic climate in northeastern Ohio, the return of the Browns, the aging of of uh, Jacobs Field, uh, you know, all those things. But but basically, you've got. You've got a small market team that yeah you can't I guess what I'm saying is you can't give Shapiro credit for the good stuff that happened on his watch, and not also see whether it was as as GM or whether it was as as president after Antonetti took over that the franchise made the same mistakes over and over again that he presided over a long, long uh, stretch of absolutely ruinous drafting and development, that there is no like Cleveland Indians brand of baseball unless it's, unless it's it, you know, d- described as guys who really don't have a plan, who may or may not hit the cutoff man, who run the bases poorly. What I'm saying is it's not like the Indians have a pipeline. People can talk about Clint Frazier or anyone else. They can talk about the young pitching. And I'm saying you can grant certain points. But you can't cherry pick the ones that make Mark Shapiro's tenure look the best without talking about the Hafner contract and the perspective because it's the same guy, uh, the Swisher and Bourne contracts. You can't you can't talk about baseball's economic playing field without looking at Oakland or Tampa or the teams that have operated far more successfully with just just as much constraint on their budget. You can't you can't factor out and this is the more inside baseball kind of stuff. Yeah, I've sat with Mark Shapiro by the way. Sat with him this summer. He he traded Cologne when I had a book proposal and he's a good guy and he's a smart guy. But one of the most troubling things about the conversation was and he did, I'm paraphrasing heavily. I didn't record it. I wasn't taking notes. But one of the most troubling things about the conversation was it was clear that Mark Shapiro had been in some ways imprinted by those 90 Indians teams, not in terms of payroll, but in terms of personality. And as wonderful as those teams were, and as, as glorious as, as those memories feel, especially to people, I was already in my 40s then, but especially to people who came of age then, those were extremely contentious teams, meaning internally. It's delightful to, to, to hear the tales of, Albert Bell smashing the thermostat in the clubhouse and all that. But go back and look at the roster and look, and look at those teams, as talented as they were. Those were some badasses in that dugout. And it was impossible to come away. But Mark Shapiro was rhapsodizing about Danny Graves, and he had to let go of Sean Casey, I believe. To, you know, 
it it it's it was clear and it was stated to some degree that what Mark Shapiro's goal was was to get a bunch of great guys together, get a bunch of guys who really, really, really were men of of high character, and that's admirable in any organization. There's nothing wrong with that, but it troubled me at the time. I didn't want Cologne traded, by the way, because I didn't know Omar Minaya was going to give up, you know, the, the Montreal Expos farm system. For, for Bartolo Colon. So we did talk baseball, and he is a good guy, and he was honest with me. But I came away thinking, I'm not sure that this guy, you know, is, is the guy who's, who's going to turn this team uh, uh, or be able to maintain, because he, he was kind of new to the job at that point, who's going to be able to maintain, forget the payroll, but maintain the same, same level of, of, of quality ball playing. And in the years that followed, you know, when you, when you see, I see whether it's Johnny Peralta, whether it's Brandon Phillips, whether, whoever it is, I see a lot of players playing key roles on more successful franchises, and it really wasn't a matter of can we afford to keep this guy because we're a small market team. It was, it was really a matter of selling cheap for guys that Eric Wedge didn't want to manage. Casey Blake, on the other hand, like, you know, sometimes I see Lonnie Chisholm and, all and think back to the days way back, back to the days of endless mediocrity, when I used to think of the Indians as a witness protection program, you know, they would take Casey Blake somewhere, teach him to hit left-handed, and call him Lonnie Chisenhall. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with Lonnie Chisenhall, and even the metrics show that Lonnie Chisenhall may be a, a, a professional uh, outfielder. He might be. Might turn out to be. He also might turn out to hit left-handed pitching very well. There's a- absolutely no evidence that he ever will. I guess my my point is, the Indians have done whatever they've done. They've turned a, a tidy little profit, not to mention the rising value of the franchise, for ownership of the team. I would suggest that somewhere between Shapiro is God and Dolan's is cheap. That reality really tends toward the Dolan's is cheap side. And that, and that asking me, telling me that Cleveland's a bad baseball town or the fans aren't really fans or it's really a football town as if the same people can't spend money on both sports, as if, as if they're actually in direct competition for the same dollar. You know, most of that to me is absolute bullshit. You, I... you, can't, deny, you can't deny the economic climate, but you can, you can say that Mark Shapiro had a... I'll be surprised if... It, let, let, let me... Put it this way, I'll be surprised if there's still a Major League Baseball team in Cleveland in five or ten years. And you cannot, you cannot uh, take Mark Shapiro. And Mark Shapiro's style of communicating, when you say conciliatory, I, I understand what you mean now. It's a perfect word. But it's been like a very long retreat with a junior executive boss talking to the people uh, that, that the customers, in the most condescending possible way, whatever the realities are, his style, he never adapted his style you know, to Cleveland. I'm not saying you, you, you need to be a blue-collar idiot, because I don't think the fan base is blue-collar idiots. What I can say is I know people who, who have had been season ticket holders since Jacobs Field opened, who still amazingly have held on to their tickets, who haven't been to one stinking game this season. That was me last year, actually. I didn't, I somehow, you know, we obviously get our tickets to partners and business partners and all kinds of different things. So it's not like I had, I, I, I skipped out on 82 games or 81 games or whatever it is. But um, I managed to avoid all Indians games in the 2014 season, not well, necessarily on purpose. It just kind of happened. Right. Because there's, there, look, the, the, again, I'm looking at the baseball reference page. Look back to Mark Shapiro's glorious years, executive of the year, and, and, and by the way, a, a lot of the media in Cleveland and nationally has carried water for Mark Shapiro a long time because Mark Shapiro returns your phone calls, and Mark Shapiro will give you a great quote. That doesn't mean that he's some horrible human being. It means that, that like a lot of front office executives and a lot of businesses, he's good at the PR. He's good at communicating. He's good at understanding what the press, whether it's radio or whether it's print, what, what they need, what they need, he'll give that to them, whether it's Peter Gammons or whether it's some guy on the beat. And, and you know, whether it's Terry Pluto, wh- whoever it is, Mark Shapiro's great at doing that. 
But if you look back at, at 2005 when they won 93 games, okay, the following year they won 78 games. Then in 2007, a horrible fucking outcome to the season, but they, they won 96 games. Subsequent years, 81 wins, 65 wins, 69 wins. Okay, and you combine that with the economic climate, you combine it with whatever, the realities of baseball, why the hell is anyone still, I mean, they've decimated their season ticket base, and to suggest that Mark Shapiro is somehow the innocent victim of baseball's economic landscape is to spit in reality's eye. And for whatever you want to say about his message to the fans, he's, he broke through to the, to the real diehards, and so it's resulted in this in this place where I, I have entire crews of people on Twitter and on our website and everywhere else trying to convince me that what I'm watching is actually entertaining and I should appreciate it, even though it's not entertaining to me and I don't appreciate it. But well, you got the corner. You got the corner bar. You got the Tomei statue. I don't know what the hell else you want. Yeah. Well, and and the the, the well, they they've won on average more games than blah blah blah. You know, the, don't it's tell fine. me what I'm watching. No, it, it, I, I look. I, I love I love metrics. I, I love the debate as long as you know it doesn't you know get get into the 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 personal stuff. Uh, but but if you're going to assemble a core of young pitching talent, and I, I think going forward there are actually some reasons to be optimistic about the team, and then you put a, a really shit defense behind, and they knew it was a shit defense. It was a shit defense last year. I don't care how high the pitcher's strikeout rates are. Hey, people are going to hit the ball. If you cannot, there is no separate. You cannot separate. You can statistically. You can look at FIP. You know, separate from, from from other metrics, and see that the Indian starters were murdered by their own defense. You know, this, this season it was it it, it was predictable. They're supposed to be you got cutting edge analytics teams. I'm not suggesting that that you know it's it's easy to compete when you're a small market team, uh, but if you put a crap defense behind good pitching, a pitching isn't really going to be nearly as effective. You know, in shutting down the opposition, it, this this doesn't require, you know, endless uh, computer simulations and hiring a saber guy. It it really is kind of obvious. And and when when you sign guys like Swisher and Bourne who are on the other side of their prime years, to where you're really paying for past performance and praying that they they can sustain some of that. It's really not a matter of well, who would you have signed. I'm not getting paid a million dollars a year. <laughs> I don't have a, a scouting staff. You know, I don't, these these businesses. You're in business. A lot of people, uh, you know, who have jobs. They're organizations. Whether it's a classroom, whether it's a university, whether it's a business, they they depend on many, many, many parts. And it's not like it's not it's not, it's not a fruitful avenue to go. Well, well, you know, what syllabus would you have put together? You know, it really isn't. There are people getting paid to do this stuff. There are front offices all over the country in baseball, you know, dealing with, dealing with diff different economic pressures. And these are really, for the most part, really smart human beings, or they wouldn't be getting paid what they're getting paid to make the decisions they're making. And the outcomes are there for everyone to see and everyone to debate and everyone to explain away. But if you look at the Indians' record during the Mark Shapiro years and you look at attendance, one of the clearest and, and causative correlations to me is between the one-loss record. And, and I'm, not talking, I'm talking about just year-to-year year where fans have just been whipsawed. It's fine to say, well, you know, Corey Kluber or, or Michael Brantley made those particular trades look great. But in the intervening five or six or seven seasons, what the, what's going on with the team and what's going on with, it, with attendance can't simply be explained away by it's really not fair because the Indians are, are a small market team. You, you can say that that's a, a factor and you can say that it's a huge factor, but you can't simply look at, at a guy like Carlos Santana or, or any of the other guys that, that Shapiro has acquired when they were in another team's minor league system turned into a productive ball player and go, he's a great general manager. And, and accompanying that, the whole Cleveland thing that, that also drives me crazy is, oh, whoever comes in is going to be worse. It's going to be even worse. This is a regime that's had stability, that's had security, 
guys have been in place for many, many years, often at more than a decade, and they've done the job that they've done. I, uh, I come into that uh, argument a lot, too, that, well, be careful what you wish for. Be careful, right, like like right. like I should be scared of some future without Mark Shapiro based on what the last ten years of my life has been as a Cleveland Indians fan. Yeah, look look at it with the Browns. You know, you have people who are still madly in love uh, with Ray Farmer because look at those undrafted, you know, free agents. And hey, we got to give Justin Gilbert another year. You, you heard this all last year about Justin Gilbert, by the way. You know that yeah the you know that's just his rookie year. It's a, it's a, it's a lose, loser's mentality. The next guy is going to be even worse. Look, at, there were people who thought Heckert was great. You know, Mangini was great. Heckert was great. On and on and on and on. Joe Banner was a genius. Look, he, he flipped this worthless. You know, Trent Richardson, we got a number one next year. You know, seriously, there are people still arguing. Yeah, I think on, on your message boards as well that, that, that this was a great trade. This is one of the best trades in football history because you can forget the outcome, the fact that, that we turned Trent Richardson into Johnny Manziel. Forget that. Just look at what, what happened to Trent, Trent, Trent Richardson, and we got a number one. Great trade. Got to so, rethink Joe Banner. I, I want to I talk about Justin Gilbert specifically for a second because it, it plays into a larger, a larger philosophy uh, when was the last time there was a, a top 10 pick or maybe any first rounder where, well, I think if you just give them more time was, was sound strategy and it worked out in your favor. Like when, when was the last time a guy showed this little and this much negative that it would actually work out in a fan base's favor? I, I, I are pe people are just trying too hard. It's, it's not, it, it's a bad pick. It didn't work. The, horrible pick, but, but you, you can't just hope. you can't just inject more time and think that Justin Gilbert's going to be a good player. I I, I hope he, he turns into a good player. I, I I'm not suggesting you don't hope. I'm saying, you know, you have to keep hope alive. Yeah, you, you have especially for the Browns. I mean, there's no denying that whether or not you think it's a bad baseball town, which I think is is nuts, uh, or a historically stupid, uh, it, it's a great football town. But he didn't draft himself. I, I got nothing against Brandon Whedon for that. He didn't draft him. These guys did not draft themselves. So, so you really have to think about what play, play like a Brown really <laughs> means. Justin Gilbert, nobody played more like a Brown than Justin, a new Brown than Justin Gilbert. And, and it, really, it really does reflect a toxic organization. You know, it, it, really, it really does. It's not just a failure on the scouting or the, the general manager or the coaching end, it's it's kind of endemic with the Browns. It's it's it, it look it, it it is what it is. I'm not, my knowledge isn't encyclopedic enough to tell you when that's worked out well. And there was one moment last season where Justin Gilbert picked off a pass, and you know made made the you know he's a great kick returner, uh, made or he was made made a nice uh, return. And so you saw it like with Brandon Whedon's. I think his second game was against the Bengals. His rookie year, and, and we didn't look great. You know, I mean, the, these guys, they all have like lots and lots of talent. So it really comes down to scouting and, 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 and then development, you know, the coaching, the coaching staff, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, people who want to argue it's still too early to write Justin Gilbert off as a bust because, or with Manziel, he's only 22. That's a legitimate point of view. You know, it, it is. It's an arguable point of view. I don't think it's persuasive. But but you can do it in order to maintain the hope that that at some point he's going to contribute that Johnny's going to contribute. I, I guess what I'm saying is it won't be with with the Cleveland Browns. There's no evidence whatsoever it would be. With, these are a whore. If Manziel or Gilbert had come into perfect situations, it's still a struggle. If Ray Farmer was the best football man ever born and Mike Pettin was the best football coach ever born. It's like any other business. It's like any other, whether it's a classroom, whether it's a business, there is going to be a learning curve. And you are competing against people who have already you know, surmounted that learning curve and have moved on to a, a more accomplished stage of, of their careers. That's who you're competing against. And that's reality. You bring, bring a guy into, into a very bad, unstable situation, 
it doesn't mean that Justin Gilbert or Manziel that they get a pass for 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 they're they're still accountable for their diligence and their work ethic and their, all that stuff. But it, but it it does mean that it's very unrealistic to think that that uh, Johnny Manziel or Justin Gilbert is ever going to be part of a Browns team that's contending for even a division. Yeah. Um. One last uh, Browns topic before I'd like to talk about the uh, the scene article about Cleveland Sports Talk Radio. Sure. Um, last year, you spent some time with Mike Pettin, and I'm I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it felt like almost apologetically said how much you liked the guy. You know, against your better judgment, maybe I. Um, and I, I love I love Mike Pettin so far. Everyone in Cleveland loves Mike Pettin. So I, I just kind of wanted an update on your feelings on him now, because you did spend time with him, and now we've seen yeah. a year of him, and and <laughs> and heading into the second season, I wonder how you're feeling about Pettin today. I, I feel kind of how I felt uh, last year in this in this sense. Uh, okay, you, you got you got a guy who clearly is. You know, very, very good at at what he knows best. The, the guy who has, you know, re- reached the point as as a defensive wizard where he's, you know, ready to take the next step uh, in theory, and someone who has has his own learning curve, by the way, because as we know as Browns fans and as fans anywhere would know and as businessmen would know. You promote someone to a position of much greater responsibility and take away, because there's much more responsibility, take away from their focus on their particular area of expertise, the thing that got them to the point of promotion to that much bigger job, and there's going to be a tough transition. And, and that, by, by the way, in the context of a rookie general manager, in the context of firing the guys who interviewed and hired Mike Pence, and in the context of a pretty much brand new NFL owner, who and no, I know the guys who cover the Browns. I talk to the guys who cover the Browns. Most of them, uh, this isn't like scoopage, and it isn't betraying the people that I talk to to tell you no one will ever convince me that Jimmy Haslam did not choose Johnny Manziel, and that Mike Pettin didn't essentially choose Justin Gilbert. No one will ever convince me of those two things. So Mike Pettin, to the extent that he gets uh, support from a front office, a competent front office, to the extent that there's talent on the field, that means that he has a chance to compete every week. Well, I think, let me put it another way. Like with Justin Gilbert and Manziel, I I think Mike Pettin is capable of winning a lot of football games as an NFL head coach. We will see this year what he has learned from last year's problems and failures on the sideline. I don't think he's going to win those games for the Cleveland Browns. That's depressing. <laughs> well, it is depressing. And, and again, it, it's not a matter of being right, because I would much rather be wrong, in which case I believe I would say, you know, I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and, and, and it's not like uh, past performance is uh, determinative of future performance. Contextually, th- this is, and, and by context, I mean, I mean you're operating, in, forget the AFC North, just the NFL. The schedule they have to play this year is much tougher than last year. They are no better off in terms of personnel, as far as I can tell. And by the way, everyone's a year older, including Joe Thomas. Yep. And nobody beats, you know, ever, no one's ever won against Father Time. So while uh, everyone's going, well, we have these all pros and we have this core, and we, uh, you know, that, the, core, the core is getting older and more beat up in the NFL every year. And I don't think Jimmy Haslam is a patient man. And I don't think the Browns are going to win. I think uh, the, their upside this year is five wins. That's, that's my, I don't want to be right. I'm just saying that, that's my honest feeling. And we'll still be able, to the extent you can separate out different factors, be able to look at Mike Pettin. And, and, you know, what, one of the things I took away from, from the time I spent in training camp last season, talking to uh, Jim O'Neill, uh, watching the team, all that, is, is when I sat only for a few minutes with O'Neill and said, you know, as a fan, all I'm asking is that other teams don't look at the Cleveland Browns defense as a bye week. You know, that they're not just running the football right down my team's throat 
week after week after. That's all. And he goes, don't you worry about that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm fine with uh, Danny Shelton's great performance so far in, in camp. I'm not so fine with drafting a backup offensive lineman, you know, in the first round. But that's neither here nor there. We know from Alex Mack going down, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the, the problem is, you know, the the... That you could you could draft Danny Shelton, but so far from the little I've seen uh, that all, any of us have seen in preseason, they're going to have some trouble stopping the run. They're going to have some trouble stopping the run. And what you said previously about the the total lack of skill position players, you know, all due respect to Brian Hartline, they they don't have uh, they don't have uh, a, a dominant running back. They don't have a single dominant pass catcher. They've got a, a a couple of B B secondary level receivers. Well, that you know, to paraphrase uh, 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 AI Al, Alan Iverson, we're we're talking about Brian Hardline. <laughs> that, that that we're talking about like uh, you know, Taylor Gabriel and and, and listen, I, I I like a lot of their I like Travis Bat. Yo, know, I I like those guys, but that's who we're talking about. Yeah, you know, we're we're talking about. Uh, uh, guys who on contending teams wouldn't be in the conversation for a starting job. No, no. no the, the, this crew would have uh, if they if this was Pittsburgh, Ben Roethlisberger would be complaining that he doesn't have any receivers. Uh, uh, you know, one one of the really tough things, and and I, I've basically boy, I you know, I can't wait to leave Twitter uh, completely. But but one of the tough things really really is saying if I'm an NFL player if I'm an NFL coach you know say whatever you want about Shanahan just to just pick an example who who the fuck given a choice would want to play for this organization and that has nothing to do with the city had nothing to do with the fan base if you're given a choice and and you're and you're a professional. I'm going to talk about a, a, a guy who, who's been dealt away, who's already had, you know, a, a career somewhere else. I'm not talking about a free agent who, who, you know, is 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 in it for for future security for his family. I'm, I'm talking about an average quality NFL player, NFL assistant. You know, who the hell would choose to come and play for this organization? The only players I mean, who choose to come it's and play for the, the only ones who come and, pl- and play for this organization get the largest contract from the Browns. It's a fact. It's strange, you know. It, I mean, what I mean, it's it's strange that that people don't put uh, all these debates in the in the context of that. I mean, I mean, not because people should embrace despair, but simply because that that's reality. It, it doesn't mean Phil Taylor is going to go on and have a great career. You know, but but it's easy, and, and I did it with with Phil Taylor. You go back and and you look at, at at when he was drafted, and he went out for dinner with Heckert, and he ordered the salmon, and uh, really, it, it's back when Tony Grossi, who who to me is a hero, by the way. People hate Tony Grossi and actually blame Tony Grossi for stuff that goes on with that franchise. Back back then. Everything that we found out about Phil Taylor, good and bad, was already really well known when he was drafted. And, and they traded back up to get him, if I'm not mistaken. They did. So whether or not he, he winds up with another team or whether he don't, whether people want to attribute it to bad health and ignore the fact that he was carrying way too much weight and had not much of a work ethic coming out of college. It was questionable, his work ethic. You know, that, that, that's an easy debate to have, uh, again, in, in retrospect. But at the time... Well, that was a that was a, as drafts go. That was a singular draft, and you can't blame Ray Farmer for that one. You know? No, let me let me remind everybody what my takeaway from that draft was, just so that I can expose myself. <laughs> um, I said the the Browns got good value in the trade down, and then I was impressed that they decisively came up and got a guy that they wanted in Phil Taylor. <laughs> that was my yeah. I think that was my summary of that draft. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, Justin Gilbert's just a different name. <laughs> yeah. I mean, jo- Johnny Manziel's elbow is just a different detail. It, look, listen, it, it's not. It's not. Who would you rather have drafted? Well, any idiot can answer that now because you know Teddy Bridgewater would look great. <laughs> uh, but 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 the truth of the matter is, there were teams who drafted in the first. There were teams among the first twenty-one who needed help at quarterback, 
didn't draft any quarterback. Whatever they got, they got. But there were reasons, you know, and, and, and it's fresh enough in everyone's mind. There were reasons to know at the time. You could call it a controversial pick. You could call it an owner's pick. You could call, but in football terms, and Deadspin, I think, had a great thing uh, where I think it was the Patriots scouting notes, where, where the, you know, the actual scouting notes that, that if you go back and look at that Deadspin post and look at, look, at, look at those, and they weren't phony, by the way. They were real. Uh, you know, people, Johnny, Johnny Manziel was a known quantity, good and bad, coming, coming out of A&M. And nothing that's happened since should be shocking in the least to, to anyone. But Joe Namath, but Party Boys, right? Scott, well, Joe, 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 I was around when Joe Namath was a rookie. I was old <laughs> enough to be a football fan. I remember Joe Namath. Johnny Manziel is, you know, it's kind of a joke because in, in terms of the physical tools, I love when people, you know, and and they still do. I think they put him in the same conversation with Russell Wilson and other quarterbacks of relatively small stature who can move. That's great, you know. And be my guest. Make the argument. I've seen John. Johnny Manziel, I've seen him in person, uh, you know, on, on the practice fields, and, and I've watched him play. And he may, I think it's a long shot, he may find some degree of success in the National Football League as a quarterback. I don't think he will, but I, I, I'm as certain as certain can be that it won't be with the Cleveland Browns. Well, and that's the thing. Russell Wilson didn't have to learn how to be Russell Wilson. Um, and to expect Johnny Manziel to learn how to be Russell Wilson when he's Johnny, it just... It, it, these these false comparisons that we make based on you know otherwise meaningless stats like height and weight and I, it just it's kind of goofy. Um, it's it, but but it's and I've done when it. You, well, and I look. It's when he rolls left, and I, I forget who caught the pass. It was like a thirty yard pass on a scramble in the one exhibition game where we got to see. It was like Gabriel, Manziel. maybe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, you know, they really are kind of interchangeable, uh, small, quick <laughs> receivers. But but you see that play like Gilbert's interception or Whedon's second game against Cincinnati, and I, I dream on it. You're everyone's allowed to dream yeah. on it. That's what keeps us going week to week. One of the problems, I, I guess, you know, for me, or one of one of the issues for me, it's it's not again just just to say, oh, the get off my lawn, grumpy old man. But but I'm pretty weary of of you know I don't get to dream for long. Let me put it that way. I, it, there's just there there's not there's not a lot of uh, att- emotional attachment right, right now uh, and in the foreseeable future uh, to teams that in, whether they're insisting or not continue to operate this way. I, and then the wide receiver thing, by the way, it drives me up the wall. I mean that's you talk about smartest guy in the room kind of stuff you know chris grant had nothing nothing on ray farmer i mean the 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 way this this guy i mean seriously either ray farmer's right and 31 other franchises are wrong or ray farmer's never going to be a competent general manager because this whole wide receiver thing they're they're again it predates ray farmer but there are wide receivers all, all over the league all over the league that that are key key parts and some of them were undrafted free agents, but a, but a lot of them came out of the draft as can't miss, and they didn't miss. But the Browns did year after year after year, and Ray Farmer really seems to have taken that shit personally. <laughs> um, well, and intermixed in all this, uh, and and how the how Browns fans end up reacting and everything else. I mean, it's all part of the story that scene did on sports talk radio, because the Browns have a uh, recording studio, a radio studio in their own building. You want to talk about uh, controlling the message? Uh, well, they, and they've also co-opted the sports talk stations. They yes. are business partners with the sports talk station. That it's no mean, accident. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's, it, it, you, you combine that with, and, and, and I have a particular insight into, uh, I have, I have many insights uh, into this, but you know, I'm, I'm a little bit constrained uh, in in what I'm comfortable saying because I'm, I'm friends. I'm, I have friends who work in the business. I also now you know work for ESPN, so you know I, I want it to be. Uh, I, I want whatever I say to be understood in the context of, of someone who's been doing radio 
since the mid '80s. Someone who's you know been in print, you know, uh, even longer than that. And someone who knows people in in sports media. Someone who makes money, and and all that. And and I guess I, I'm trying to contextualize this. On the on the one hand, the Browns are a huge business that has quite wisely partnered up with a lot of the people who cover the Browns. But it's strictly in the context of the business end. Uh, you know, I've, I've done some regular stuff. Now, I would never want, I don't think I, I could ever do an actual show, you know, like Rizzo does or, or, you know, guys like Adam the Bull. Guys who've made their living by doing three- and four-hour shifts are a very special breed and, and for, good, for good and ill. It's a very tough job in any market. Uh, it's easier in a happier market, of course, but it, but it's still tough. And there was a point because I, I'm doing a, a, an, another book, a sequel to The Horror of Akron, uh, uh, where I knew I was going to be spending a lot of time in Cleveland, and and I, I talked to, to you know someone who who runs one of the stations, and I talked about. Uh, Maybe doing something more regular, and maybe you know, as you, as you get old, and I'm 63 now, uh, you, you, your stamina, your your energy, all all that stuff uh, it doesn't go it doesn't go up; it goes down. But you also want to transition uh, in ways that that comport with your own passions and that, that help you keep the cash flowing. So I talked with someone about doing more regular work, and and they they seemed you know absolutely willing, and then said, and and we're not a union shop. So, you know, we'll pay you uh, $15, one, five dollars an hour. This is a problem. It's not a problem for me. It's a joke to me. It's a problem. It, you, you got guys who are working their, their asses off and stations that, you know, whatever, whatever the books say, the books say, I have no, no insight nor interest. Uh, but they're making money. Trust me, they're making money. You know, reading those ads, all that stuff, and they're paying people shit. That's a problem, and and it strictly comes down to money. It's so do sports, so, so do the teams. By the way, they're not in business to salve the wounds of long, you know, abused Cleveland fans. They're in business to make money, whether it's the Dolans, whether it's Jimmy Haslam, whether it's Dan Gilbert. Of course, Dan's the only one who believes in the theory that in order to make money, you need to spend money. But even when it comes to the Dolans, whatever argument you want to make about how they bought high from the, you know, the, the brilliant Jacobs brothers, uh, yeah, you know, the franchise, is, according to them, is worth $800 million. According to Forbes, I think it's worth $600 million. Dolans aren't going to lose any money on the Cleveland Indians. And when they sell, like I say, it's, it's likely going to be to, to people who are going to take the team away. And they'll walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, the same thing happens on, on, on the radio or, or broadcast side, where you've got guys who've spent their entire lives, entire lives, working their asses off in that market who aren't getting paid well at all. That Partly that's the nature of radio. Partly it's the nature of sports talk radio. Partly it's the nature of a relatively depressed economic area. But it, it, may, it makes it at least uh, clear to me that there's not a lot of, you know, there's a lot, of, like with the message boards, there's a lot of backbiting going on, and there's some great personalities. There are some guys who would flourish in any market. I'm thinking specifically of a guy who's a friend, I consider like a dear friend, Ken Carmen, who I think is a brilliant guy. And, you know, I, I think like with Johnny Mansell or Justin Gilbert, or Mike Patton, or a lot of other people, some of these guys, the best of them, are going to do their flourishing elsewhere. If, if they have the option. It's very difficult outside of any, any person's attachment to family and to home. It's very difficult to, to, for, me, for me to understand why anyone would choose. And I get this all the time personally because of the LeBron thing. Well, you left. You know, right. what could be more hypocritical, asshole? You left. Yeah, you know, you know what? Outside of all the other differences, I could come back to Cleveland now and make $15 an hour. Yeah. I, why, would, why, why would, I mean, look, I, I, Ken Carmen, just to use a specific example, 
you know, the guys, guys integral now part of the, he built the Friday night thing into a franchise. He's an integral part of, of the, what I think is, is kind of the most important that, that, that morning show, uh, even saddled with the millstone, with, you know, with a, with a millstone partner. And he's doing national stuff for CBS. He's a young guy. He's a gifted guy. What, what is the environment in, in Cleveland? You know, what, 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 outside of, again, making money for, for the, the people that own them, what is going to make a difference in, in the Cleveland market is, you know, primarily, primarily a success. Success. Not just making a few dollars, which the Dolans do, you know, et cetera. But but what drives that is a is a sense of optimism. It's kind of what, what like what's driving Donald Trump now. We need victories. Yeah, we really need victories. The market needs victories. The market needs to recognize, nurture, and reward young talent. It needs stability. It needs a lot of things. But you know, I read the whole thing in the scene. I thought about the whole thing in the scene. I know I know a lot of the players. There, it's a it's a worthy article. But but it's really tough. It's really tough to to understand how m- money is the only driver here. That's the only driver. You're, you're you're counting on on people, you know, to 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 give you their absolute best day in and day out, like in any other business. And are you creating the atmosphere for them to succeed? It's not just about salary or, or, or any of that. It's like, are you creating the right atmosphere for them to succeed, or are you mo- much more worried about ad sales? Yes. And you have to worry about the ad sales. I, I'm in, you know, in, in print. I, I understand ad sales. It, it, no, nobody, nobody's, nobody's paying my salary by going to the newsstand and picking up a copy of Esquire magazine. Right. That's never been true. It's based on, on how many ad pages they're able to sell during the course of the year. That's that's what floats the boat. That's what floats the boat in Cleveland sports radio. And that's the biggest takeaway for me from all that stuff. And, and it's a conversation that I've been having for months, you know, ever since I had Joe Lull on for the first time after he got let go or exited, however you want to put that. But the yeah. idea to me is that, and I don't want to be too precious about it. I don't want to pretend like, like but I do think there's an art to sports talk radio. I, I, I love talk radio. That's why I started doing this podcast. That's, that's what keeps me wanting to do this all the time. And I do think that there's a bit of, of talent and artistry to it. And I think like you, I'm friends with a lot of the players on the radio and I don't blame them. I think, I think the environment's pretty toxic and, and it's, it's, uh, it's heavy, you know, it's just heavy on them to all act the same, sound the same, have the same kind of beats in their shows. And it's taken any kind of the person. The reason that you would hire a personality is because they are different from the next person um, who precedes them in the order on the day. And and they've done everything to kind of put them in a box where they all sound the same with the same beats in their show. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's t- it's tough. It's a competitive business. It's it's an unstable business, and it's a very demanding business. I used I used to do uh, weekly spots on WIP in Philly, a much different market, much different sports talk radio market. At least it was when I was doing the spots, and I you know I, I was friends with and and friendly with uh, uh, the two guys uh, who did it every day, and you know the older one. Uh, uh, would say it's like being stuck in a shoebox for four <laughs> hours every day, you know, doing exactly the same thing. It's it's really tough. You know, I listen to F A W F A N because uh, I, I still live in North Jersey. All that stuff. It's hard under the best of circumstances, but it, but it really it really is about the ad dollars. Whether it's the you know Rizzo, and, yeah, and and there's still by the way ESPN is still working on the uh, thirty for thirty. About Cleveland sports misery. I think we talked about it way back yes. when. It's way late, you know, and I think it's going to be great. But yeah, I, I definitely have a dog in the hunt. Uh, but you know, there are guys. That, you know, whether it's Windhorse, whether it's Rizzo, you know, there, there are guys that, that whose voices will be, you know, you know, part of that mix. It it is part of the texture of Cleveland sports. It's an important part of the texture, but it absolutely reflects the teams. Both, both in terms of the overall negativity 
and in order of operating under kind of severe constraints. But, but again, a lot of it comes down to, given the choice, how many, how many young, talented, ambitious people are going to choose to remain in that market? And that really is, it, it comes down to that for the, for the operation itself, which is, which is rarely, if ever, a local, locally owned operation. And it comes down to the individual talent, whether you're talking about you know, players and, and coaches, whether you're talking about radio guys. It's like what, you have your own priorities and your own life you know, to, to, to lead and your own decisions to make. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, if the guy in Philly felt like he was in a shoebox, I got no real clue, no real insight into what a guy doing it for, for three or four hours a day, five, five or more days a week in Cleveland is going to feel like. I also, before, before we leave, I, I just, you know, not because I'm trying to pimp a book that's not even written yet, I just wanted to revisit LeBron briefly. Yeah. Since, to some degree, you know, there's, there was no one who was more vocal in, in his hating. I'm putting that in quotes, in his hating. LeBron made absolutely the right decision, it turns out, to leave. LeBron has matured incredibly. I sold LeBron short. I think for, for people who read or, or, or at least you know, put some effort in, into uh, what I actually wrote in the Horror of Akron, uh, you know, would, would, would consider me less of a hater, uh, I would hope. But what, one of the things that became clear to me, starting with his decision to return to Cleveland, was that I, was, you know, I, I never wanted to have any impact on, on Le- LeBron's career outside of that wishful, uh, you know, I hate this guy and I hope his career goes exactly like Trent Richardson's or worse. Outside of that vengeful thinking, you know, it's not like I thought I was ever going to move the needle on anything. I just thought it was a miracle that as the one Cleveland fan who had a book deal, I would be able to draw at least a little bit of blood, you know? Yeah. Uh, he wasn't going to get, a, which is why it's not noble, it's idiotic, it's immature. And I'm a lot older than LeBron. So, so I think it's, it's, it's very, it's rich at this point. In many ways, uh, having having somehow contrived uh, to attach myself to the greatest athlete that Northeastern Ohio has ever produced, I'm the only one I know of with no actual, you know, interest or you know, financial interest in, in LeBron who has made money off <laughs> LeBron James. It's not a matter of embarrassment or oh, I've been humbled. I'm not talking about any of that bullshit. I'm saying. This is life's life's rich pageant. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm like the luckiest Cleveland fan ever born. I I understood that a long time ago before there was a LeBron James, uh, but in this particular instance, I couldn't be happier. I mean, happier to say he, the kid did the right thing. He came back as as a grown man, and whether the Cavs ever win a championship or not is kind of moot for me. LeBron, as far as I'm concerned, made good on everything I was upset about. The return. I, did we ever talk? Did we ever do a, a podcast after? I can't even remember. No, no. You and I uh, hung out a couple times and saw each other yeah. a couple times, but no, we never, we never put it on we the went record. To, we went to the wine and gold scrimmage together. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we ever podcasted, so I, I wouldn't want to finesse anything or pretend like I. I, in, I mean, I couldn't even get media credentials from the Cavs for for media day last year, where they issued hundreds of credentials. They wouldn't even let me in the building. And this is, I used to, and, 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 you know, to me, one of the fascinating things is, you know, for two years I was their boy because I started working on the book before LeBron left. And, of course, everything changed, you know, when, when he decided to go to Miami. But for those two seasons, his last season in, in Cleveland, his, his first season in Miami, I wasn't just credentialed, you know. I'd, I'd get late night phone calls from Dan Gilbert, uh, right. you know, to, to talk about it. So, I mean, it, I'm not saying that they should have let me in the building. I Believe me, I totally get it. I'm just saying it's very funny to me, and it's something I, I certainly don't mind talking about. Uh, and in this case, because I used to do the, you know, the podcast with you far more often. Sure. And I, I didn't, that I, that I just wanted to bring up the fact that whatever uh, happens in, in, in the future with the Cleveland Cavaliers, I mean, Le, LeBron for the seven years, before he left for Miami, wasn't wasn't the general manager. Whatever power he had was the power he had, and whatever Danny Ferry did or Mike Brown did, you know, Le- 
LeBron James is not accountable for, and it's not entirely within his power right now whether the Cavs ever win. But what he has done, both on and off the court since he's been back, is real. You know, that's that's not it's not not oh well, show me the banner, and it's not well the University of Akron thing really doesn't involve directly involve his. You know, it's it's amazing to me. The arc of this guy's narrative is amazing to me. It's one of the great stories in professional sports ever in this country. And to the, to the extent I made uh, factual assertions or portrayed him in a certain way, as right as I might have felt at the time, I was wrong. And I, this isn't a sales job on, you know, on anyone. It's, uh, to me, it's fantastic. Well, it's and the this same is... as if, if the Browns go 14-2 and two and win the Super Bowl this year. There won't be a happier fan in the world or one who's more willing to admit what a, what a complete moron he was to have missed the fact that, that he was wrong. And that's exactly what I was going to say. It comes straight back to all the any doom and gloom that, that I profess about the Indians or the Browns or anything else that's going on. I, I, I look forward to the day where I could say it was wrong and I could do it through tears of joy. I mean, I, what LeBron gave to us last year, just being in and around the city um, – during those games, even games I didn't have tickets to, we, we flocked downtown to restaurants just because we had to be close to it. You know, some friends and I, and yes. I mean that, that it doesn't get more real than that. You know, whether, no. they, whether they raise the trophy or not, it doesn't get any more real than that. No, I was, I was, uh, uh, because I, I, I am writing a book and I, I had a bedroom in a, in a condo that Brian Winhorst owns. And, and so I was spending a lot of time in the city. I got to bring my kid. Uh, you know, I didn't. I did not miss a home playoff game after the Boston series, so I got to. I got to bring my kid uh, with me for the the last two games, games three and four against the Hawks. So I got to sit sit with my kid. It it was anything that someone you know who grew up ranting as I have and and all that about it was. I understand it's not a championship. I get that. Yeah. You know, but but you know. You you could not beat that. You you just you and I, you know I, I actually had to run run out to do, to do uh, ESPN thing after the game, which which ain't so bad either, by the way. You know to to be outside the queue, uh, basically getting mo- literally mobbed while 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 waiting to go on air with with in, in this case with Mark Stein. But you know I mean it was an awesome culmination of a lifetime spent and no. They didn't win the championship, but to you know, to be able to take my kid and I paid, you know, I, same with the Indians, same with the Browns. I'm not going there on a media pass. Right. I'm paying. I'm buying tickets, and in that case, you know, paying a lot of money for decent seats. And it was everything that I that I could have asked for. And as angry and negative and and whatever as I often am about Cleveland sports. You know, it's it's like the, the the banner. No one can ever take that experience away from you. No one can ever take that experience away from me. It's wonderful. It's wonderful for the guys who who are in the shoebox for four hours every day. It's wonderful for the restaurant tours. It's wonderful for P. I'm not sure it's so wonderful, by the way, for the people who actually live in the city of Cleveland. But that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. You All know, right. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Last last but not least. So, uh, wh- how far along is the book? What else? Uh, no, I, it, it, it's it's not you know it's funny because because uh, had the had the had the had the uh, Cavs won, it would have set up a whole different you know deadline. R- right now, there's I, I, on the Harper same uh, publisher same same editor so it, you know it's not they they totally understand it's not going to be a, a typical basketball book and it wasn't entirely dependent on on the Cavs winning the championship. But had they won the championship, I would assume, you know, knowing knowing myself as a writer, that I would have written the book by now. I would have had to because they would have wanted to rush it out, not not rush it out so that it, you know, people, no one's going to buy the book wondering what's going to happen to the Cavs. They will, <laughs> they will have known by that time. But but right right now the the deadline is kind of blurry because we have time and we can wait, just like with the first book where I had a year before he left. In free agency, it's not bad to have a year of reporting under my belt and to go forward into this season. So at, the, at this point, I, I can't even tell you when, when the 
publication date is because we're just not sure. And with the Republican convention, uh, you know, coming to Cleveland next summer, which I, I think is going to be a very turbulent time. I mean, a lot, a lot of what, man, you don't want to talk about Cleveland as, as you know, in, in entirely negative terms or as some some symbol of what what what's been building from my point of view what's been building in in, in urban uh america and not just urban but but you know cleveland still the most segregated my god you know it, it's unbelievable uh how how tough times continue to be uh in in cleveland and i don't know i don't know i never want to write a sports book in the sense of uh uh, you know, we got photos in the middle of the athlete in various stages of his career, and we're entirely focused on, on the formula of a sports book. So, so really, the overall answer is I don't know. I don't know how far right now. Not very far along. Well, and that's 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 fine. As you said, nobody's going to be looking to. Uh, I, I can't wait to see how it ends. <laughs> right? Did they win the title? <laughs> but thanks, well, thanks for asking because, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's it's really I'm way past the point of it being about sales, and that's not, you know, unless a book catches fire, that's that's not the point anyway to me. Uh, I actually came up as a as a creative right, you know, as a not as a journalist and, and have a master of fine arts degree, uh, and and didn't think of a career in journalism, and and uh, the, you know things have worked out fabulous for me, uh, but you know it's it's really. It's funny because because one of the things, and it's going to sound horrible, one of the things that you do, if you're me, uh, you know, like my wife and I created a small scholarship at Cleveland State. This, you know, a couple of years ago now, and, and mm-hmm. you know, for for creative writing there, uh, you really do want to give back. You know, I mean, and and I don't know that I wind up in Cleveland. I always assumed I would, and and I'm not sure at this point. But but one of the things that you would want a book to be. It, and I thought about this back during the Keep Cleveland Strong campaign, <laughs> you know, to renew the countywide tax, to help the billionaires fund their op- their profit-making operations. You know, it, it's one of the things that, and, and Wahoo, by, by the way, just to circle back, what, one of the things I'll remember Mark Shapiro for, and Mark Shapiro is a smart guy, a Princeton guy, a thoughtful guy. I never talked to him about Wahoo. This was like literally 14, you know, however many years ago. But that, but that's one one of the along, along with all of the conciliatory communication this and that it, it's way past time to get rid of both Wahoo and the and the Indians in terms of the name and that's one of the things that that I that to me is one of the legacies of Mark Shapiro is he put up a Jim Tomei statue when there was no Larry Doby statue and I know this sounds like like playing the race card and it is yeah. by the way it is playing the race card. He picks Jim Tomey out of all those those players, none of whom left the way Jim Tomey left. That's the statue, and Wahoo endures because Mark, Mark Shapiro either wasn't willing or wasn't able to do what I feel certain Mark Shapiro knows is the right thing to do. I and get get rid of that fucking cart that racist cartoon that if it was any other group of humanity. Any other group would have been gone long ago, no questions asked, almost no questions asked. If that's what's keeping you bound to the Cleveland Chief Wahoo, is that essential to your fanhood as a tribe fan? You really need, need – it's not about that you're a racist, you're an idiot. I, I agree that everybody, everybody in the Indians organization, I think if you took a vote, most of them would say it's wrong. Like, if you could get the honest, honest opinion. Well, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not comparing it to Charleston. I guess you, whenever you say I'm not comparing it, and then you mention it, you are. So I'm not comparing <laughs> it to, to the Confederate flag and, the, you know, what, what ensued in, in, in the slaughter in, in, in the church in Charleston. But I'm saying you, you can't have it both ways. You, you cannot, sorry, that was, that was my alarm. Uh, you cannot, you cannot simply say, well, you know, my, my, Great great grandparents didn't do this, and my great. You cannot talk about. Uh, you can't have the debate. You're not. Uh, you're not the one who gets to decide whether it's racist or not, unless unless your your people are being uh, hammered. But by, by, and to suggest that symbols mean nothing, good. Then get rid of it. Then symbols mean nothing, and let's do something that that doesn't reinforce 
the genocidally racist stereotypes. And that's really what we're talking about here. You want to argue history, then you don't know history. If you're arguing with me about Native Americans, then you're an idiot. If you're that attached to that, that particular cartoon because that embodies the essence of your relationship to the team, then you're an idiot. If, you know, on and on and on, you want, you want to talk about whatever you want to talk about. It, look, I have the tattoo. I'm trying to figure out the right way to get rid of the tattoo. I've had it since 1994. I'm just saying, if, if, this, if this is something that, that, that Mark Shapiro couldn't manage to sell to the Dolans or Mark Shapiro was too worried about alienating more fans, or uh, to me it's a question of courage and cowardice. And he walked away from that team, and he's going to walk away in 2015. And this, to me, is just as much a part of his legacy as the one-loss record. That's all I'm saying. That's all he's saying. That's all he's saying. That's it. I'm just saying. I'm yeah. not saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I uh, I absolutely love any any chance I get to talk to you. So I really appreciate you spent a lot of time with us today. Well, it, it's, you know, I got in touch with you and I forget at what point I was so, so aggravated and it wasn't any particular thing. It was this overall feeling like, you know, I, I and you've heard this from me before. I don't, I, I, I don't feel like there's necessarily any upside here uh, in terms of convincing anyone of anything in terms of proving myself right, I don't feel that way at all. I, I feel the opposite, and that's one of the reasons I didn't want to devote a weekly amount of time. Is I feel like I'm saying exactly the same things. There's no effect whatsoever. It's fine with me. I just needed to vent a little, and I really appreciate you giving me the chance to do it. And I really, I'm around on, on those board, you know, on, on the boards. I don't want to. There's no no sense in me participating. I have so much work. Seriously, I have a hard time keeping up with it. But I am honestly grateful for the chance to weigh in to the extent that anyone, any, it sounds all oh, very humble, but I, I understand there, there are a lot of people who, who agree with me. There are a lot of people who disagree with me. And uh, believe me, I'm, I'm appreciative of your time and, and the time of anyone listening, truly. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, whenever whenever it is you want to come on again, just just put up the signal, and we'll do it. Uh, I appreciate Thanks. it very much, and until I next, appreciate it too. Thanks, until Rick. next time, everybody. It's been the Waiting for Next Year dot com podcast. Thanks again to Scott Rabb for jumping on the Waiting for Next Year dot com podcast. As always, the listeners of the Waiting for Next Year podcast can get a free trial on Audible, audibletrial.com forward slash WFNY, over 180,000 titles. You get a free audiobook download on your 30 day free trial. That's audibletrial.com forward slash WFNY. Thanks to all those who've signed up, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>